Leslie Shokat is the director and executive producer of uh, Helter Skelter, an American myth, uh, which uh, details the life and the crimes of Charlie Manson. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby. And Leslie, why are we still talking about Charles Manson? I, I think that's the where, where to start with this because I think that the public thinks that they know a lot about him and yet there is so much new information in this documentary. So why, why do you think we're still talking about him? I think it's because the puzzle pieces don't fit. Um, I think that when you have these two sets of crimes where five people were killed the first night and two the second night, and they seem to be without motive, a motiveless crime, is that possible? And I think because the prosecutor took it upon himself to come up with a motive because the crimes were not understandable, we, we talk about that. We talk about the motive. And yet at the same time, what possessed these seemingly normal boys and girls from down the road to join what was most assuredly a cult and some of them, a small group of them, commit these horrific, unspeakable crimes. And it's still not understandable because it doesn't quite make sense in the same way that cults with leaders that are crazy to people outside the cult, but when you're in it, it just gets gradually, gradually, gradually worse. And you're asked to do more and more strange things. And, it, 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 and then suddenly you realize, oh my God, I'm doing these horrible things. And I think there's this fear that a lot of us have. We're like, oh, I would never do that. I would never be in a cult. I would see it. It wouldn't be like these people. And yet, because they came from these normal backgrounds, there's that fear like, oh, could it, could it happen to me? And I think that that also fascinates people. I, I, you, so you talk about you know, how, how these nor seemingly normal people end up joining this cult. And in talking to some of the people who were a part of you know, Spawn Ranch and, and were a part of Manson's orbit, did you come away with an answer to that question as to, as to why these people, did they give you any insight as to what it is about Manson and that lifestyle that drew them in? I'm not sure I'll ever fully understand it, but when you talk to Diane Lake, who's just so well-adjusted and a mother now, and you know, you're, you're, you're talking to her about things at the time and you're looking at someone that you know, could be your grandmother telling you about having an orgy and taking LSD and Charlie Manson raping her and all of these horrible things. And you just look at, and, and you look at her and you're like, this does not match. And so, on the one hand, it makes me think it, it could have happened to a fair amount of people because a lot of these men and women didn't have a lot in common. On the other hand, it was a very unique time in history. Um, you had the Vietnam War. Racism was a curse throughout the nation. You had people taking LSD for the very first time. It was new in the history of the world. So it's not as if there was all of this scientific uh, knowledge and studies that were well circulated that that people could know about. And you have people protesting and you have people wanting to drop out and Charlie comes along and he's a decent guitar player and he writes a song that seems like it's about you. I mean, part of this is girl falls for a rocker. Just it's like that simple, right? And then the men see the guy has all the girls. So he comes up with a few great acid rap phrases, which is what they called it at the time, you know, when you come up with these to uh, a person who isn't tripping, some phrase that sounds inane, but when you're all dropping acid together, sounds like it came from God and it's genius, right? And you isolate them out on Spawn Ranch. You give each person like a new name. You alternate with sex and love and abuse. Um, and you keep the news and, and time and television and everything away from him, away from the people, that's like a class, what we know now as a classic cult. So he did everything right. He took everything he learned in prison. Now, why it ended up as crazy as it was is another story. But if he had said that we're gonna go and move out to the desert and live off the, of the land and, try and find this place where we can live underground forever. You know, everybody would have been like, you're crazy. But when he just introduced like one new thing each week, right? That's the thing about cult leaders. They have to keep reinventing things so that you want to follow them. 
I, you know, he is such an interesting figure. But I think that what this film does is really go into his background more than I've really seen and been aware of in terms of his childhood and his upbringing. And so in researching him and going back and looking at his family history and some of the things that happened to him uh, as a child, um, what sort of insights did you take away in terms of learning about Manson, the man and not just the personality? I think I kind of learned a lesson here because I wondered at the beginning, is it okay to show that someone who committed monstrous acts later in life had a hard time growing up and, 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 and wasn't taken care of and did have a horrific childhood? Is it okay to create empathy for a minute for that person? And ultimately, you know, unless you believe that kids are born bad or some are born bad, I think it was really important to look at his strict upbringing in West Virginia and how his mom went to prison when he was five and not just any prison, like the most God awful prison in all of the US, Moundsville prison with like super thick walls. And he would go and visit her every week. And, you know, his uncle was trying to raise him strict. And when he misbehaved one day, he had to wear a dress to school. Like these are things that we would be horrified by now but he really had a horrific childhood. And yet very early on, you start to see some of these tendencies, these manipulative tendencies and things like this. So I thought if we went back to the beginning and we found people who knew him, who went to church with him, you know, who did all these other things with him and people that talked to his cousin at the time and people that were close to him, I thought it would really help understand how someone could end up like he did. You know, he too was raped in prison. Does that excuse anything that he did later? No, but it, 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 it does make you sit there and think, oh, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it both in his case? Does one of the, one of the things that I really responded to in this was, and I, and you've touched on it a little bit is there's, these patterns that we see repeating themselves, these atmospheric patterns in terms of what's going on in society becoming like the perfect breeding ground for someone like a Charles Manson to become effective. And I noticed that in, in, in a, a couple of the episodes, you know, you're, we see some of the same things we're seeing right now in terms of like, you know, media being targeted at certain people or being taken from certain people or racial unrest between, you know, black people and the police. Did you see any, any things in here that, that shook you that, that made you kind of go, whoa, there's a lot of parallels to today? Yeah, I think um, that that's exactly right. What we're what you're saying. Part of it comes from what we have now that we have then is we have a lot of man. Like we're trying to, you know, we recently had a, a very controversial president, right? It was the same thing back then. We had unpopular foreign wars. It was the same thing back then. We had people kind of receding from society, saying, "I'm not liking." what the government or what what's going on here. So I'm gonna form my own tribe, right? And it's kind of the beginning of this tribal behavior in the late 60s. And you absolutely see that now. And after a while, people don't have the tools to process all of this mayhem. So they fall in and they follow a person who could be lying to them day after day, but they repeat the same phrases over and over again. I mean, that's not that different from now. And these people start to get conditioned and they don't, they're not aware that they're in this group. And let's not forget when the family first started, living out in the desert, out in nature, working with horses, getting leftover perfectly good food from the trash can. It was all about love and LSD and orgies and all like, this was attractive to people who didn't like what was going on in society at the time. So it started out one way and ended up something else completely. And I think by, you know, all of the great editors that we had on this project, we all wanted to do an anthropological dig into the time. You hear the weather report, you know it's smoggy, just like it is now, you know, 51 years later. 
And we wanted to go beyond kind of this tabloid-esque coverage that had happened in the past. We also wanted to make sure that you don't forget about the very real victims. A lot of times the fascination with the family, you forget how horrific the crime was and, and how horrible it was for those victims and their families who, because of the popularity of the cult in terms of not, not the cult itself being popular, but the fascination, have to relive this over and over again. Sorry, I got off topic. No, no. And I, I, that actually dovetails perfect into what I was going to ask you was, you know, they're, they're, the crime scene photos, uh, many people haven't seen them. Um, and this documentary shows them. Was that a deliberate choice on your part? And, and, and why did you feel it was important uh, to put those in there? It was. Um, uh, my editor, Francie, and I, um, she, we cut that scene, the murders, at um, the Tate house and then the La Bianca household the next night a number of different ways. And ultimately, it's like, initially, I thought going into it, I'm not going to show it. It's too gory. It's too horrible. But when you learn the background and you learn that the majority of the family members did not commit murder and were not part of this, and there's certain ones that you start to, you know, you think, oh, they're not horrible, evil people on the surface of it or before they came in contact with Charlie. You cannot forget, no matter how much they were under the influence, the acts itself were gory and horrific. And we felt that if we didn't show, and there's only one photo per murder, and that's it, we felt that if we didn't show it, we would be letting them off the hook. And we wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. So it's in complete silence. It's only up for a short period. And that, that felt like honoring the victims with only one photo while not letting the actual murderers off the hook, even if they were under the influence for doing it. You know, people were killed and it's a pretty serious thing. So that's why we came up with that choice. There, there, there is a, I feel like there's a certain cinematic quality to this, to this series um, in, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the establishing shots and you, you mentioned the smog and, and all that kind of stuff. So as a director, uh, what were some of the, the stylistic decisions that you made in terms of how you wanted this series to look? Uh, there were um, some very interesting things about the 60s, especially in Los Angeles, being a native Californian myself, um, al although I wasn't around at that particular time, but I remember seeing smog as a kid you know, you could, it was worse than it is now. You could see it like in, in the valley, you can see it now, but sometimes you could see it across the street. And um, there were lines, you know, for gas at a certain point and the radio sounded a certain way. And there were people up and down, like how fun would it have been to be able to hitchhike up and down PCH when everybody was doing it, when a hundred people were lined up to hitchhike. And you know, before things like this, it was a much more innocent thing. And you could meet Dennis Wilson out somewhere and he could invite you back to his house to hang out you know, because stars and celebrities weren't shielded like they were right now. So you could go to a club on Sunset and you could have an ex-con next to a movie star, next to a musician, next to a poet, right? And the music scene in the late 60s was so fantastic. So I wanted to do things, visual things and audio things that put you right in the cultural currency of the time. Um, and then when it came time to what I call original photography instead of um, reenactments because they're more impressionistic, a lot of what people had seen with the family is all shot of the family after the murders. And some of the people that appear in all of that footage were the people that had not been arrested and didn't commit any of the crimes. Some had, but some hadn't. So um, I thought it was important to shoot at Spawn Ranch, to shoot out in the desert and to capture some of these moments and then blend them in with the stock footage that we actually had. So you can, you can tell when we're shooting most of the time versus the archival and when we were doing that, 
we chose, I chose a color palette that was representative of that time, a shoot, a specific shooting style and more of an impressionistic thing. Sometimes when he picks up a girl, you might just see her feet getting on the bus. You might not know which girl it is in particular. Yeah. I was thinking of, of some of those smog scenes of, of LA and thinking about like what it looks like outside when there's a, when last summer during the wildfires, um, yeah. it's amazing how cyclical it is. Yeah, that's right. Especially that red, orange kind of smog, you know, California has these beautiful sunsets and you, you think of California as being like orange and ambers and pinks, but a lot of the orange and the amber has always been from smog. You know, some of it's from sunset, but it's got that particular gritty, I call it like the LAX look, <laughs> right? You know? Um, I love that the, that, the, that the subtitle of this is an American myth. Um, because I think there is a certain uniqueness to uh, American uh, to to mythology in America. So, what do you think are the ingredients of mythology in America, and why did you decide to have that as the subtitle of this? We actually added it later in the game because you know before the reason that I did this project is because I didn't understand the fascination with the Manson family, you know. And I kept meeting all these people that have read the book multiple times and they knew the names of all the girls and the boys and the photographs and even the ones that were only with them for a short period. And I'm like, what is this fascination, you know? And part of it is this mythology that has been built up around Charlie. And, and that is that he was a bearded Svengali, a mastermind criminal that planned and orchestrated everything and was going to systematically bring about a race war. When the reality is he went from one con to the next and one paranoid blunder after another paranoid blunder. And he had to keep reinventing things. So he came up with Helter Skelter. He was racist. So that part wasn't hard, but was he ever going to actually try and bring out a race war? Not from anyone I talked to. Some of the family members believed that he might try that. And a lot of them thought it was campfire talk or they didn't know what to believe. And at some point they all became afraid of him. So they went along with it because they thought that he would kill them if they didn't. Um, that doesn't make them not culpable, but that kind of mindset was very surprising to me. So I kind of wanted to knock him off of that pedestal. Number one, because he doesn't deserve a pedestal. And number two, because he wasn't, he was a small time con artist with some really good raps and these desperate acts got out of control and he did a lot of horrible things, but was he a mastermind planner that should be kind of idolized in that way? No. Mm. I think the, I think the film has so much that uh, we can learn uh, in hopes of not repeating it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Like beneath this sort of spectacular tabloid-esque coverage of this, underneath it all, underneath the spectacle, I guess you could say, there's a moral seriousness to what happened. And I think that should be looked at when you look at other American myths. But, you know, he had the thing about wanting to make it big and a rock star. He was... Uh, he had real charisma, you know, and then he had this street credibility because of his hard life. And he told you what you wanted to hear. I can't tell you how many people I interviewed just on background to get information who felt that they were the only one who knew the real Charlie. And they all thought they were the only one. And he conned them all, whether it was to have them send in the cell phone or whether it was to have this heart-to-heart -heart conversation that he couldn't have with anybody else. He just told people what they wanted to hear and he was really good at it, but that's it. Well, it's, it's such a fascinating uh, film. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, uh, make your predictions for the Emmys and stay tuned for more uh, interviews with Emmy contenders throughout the season. Leslie Chokot, uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you.